Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Andava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Tech Reimagined, the Andava podcast. We're now in season two, aiming to tackle some of the big questions we have today around technology and the way that it influences our lives. I'm happy to welcome today a dear guest of ours, Brian McBride, to discuss the big questions around how technology helps business scale. Hello, Brian. Would you like to introduce yourself? Bradley. Hi there. Uh, I'm great. Thank you. Um, yeah. What am I currently up to? Well, I, I chair Trainline, uh, the, the booking uh, app company that went public a couple of years ago. It's not been an easy year for anyone involved in travel, but we can talk about that later. Uh, I'm on the board of Standard Life Aberdeen, the big uh, <coughs> Scottish based uh, asset management company. I'm on the board of Kinevik, a Swedish technology investor, which owns shares in uh, Babylon and uh, Zalando and, and big companies like that. I'm also an advisor at Scottish Equity Partners, and I'm the lead non exec in the, the government's Ministry of Defence board. Uh, prior to that, I've been involved in digital stuff for a large part of my life. I chaired ASOS before this one, and I was chief exec of Amazon in the UK from 2006 to 2011 and work for T-Mobile, work for IBM, work for digital. So I've been involved in stuff that involves bits and bikes and techie things for probably 25 years. Well, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. So let's get straight stuck into some of the questions. So without stating the obvious, what, what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen to the successful companies during the pandemic? Well, I think obviously that there's a bunch of universal uh, challenges that regardless of your industry, and, and that's really two things. One is keeping management in good contact with each other and then keeping employees engaged and, and with the company as well. And I think most people have now figured it out. It was a scramble at the start, even for good, you know, uh, well-endowed companies with great technology, uh, just getting to work with, you know, Teams and Google and Zoom and all of these things was a bit of a challenge. And of course, many of us still forget to put our mics off. But the basic bits like that, I think, were quite important in getting getting business continuing to move it. And, and my view from seeing a number of different industries is it, it's worked pretty well. I think many people are itching to get back to the office. I think people do miss a little bit of the, you know, standing around a flip chart or, or noodling or the kind of water cooler or coffee machine chats. But, you know, we've all survived. <clears throat> I think the bigger changes are probably in those industries that, um, you know, are customer facing. Uh, and, and obviously the, the online players, you know, your, your, your Amazons and ASOS and Boohoo and, and all of these guys, they've done pretty well. You know, they, they have reacted. And of course, if you're in the fashion business, uh, nobody's buying, you know, evening wear or going out wear. It's much more about, you know, leisure wear and that's leisure and stuff like that. So I think you've seen many companies respond very quickly to that. But even the traditional uh, retailers, I mean, I think the big grocers, the big supermarkets have done very, very well to get their you know, their, their driver count up, you know, to be able to give uh, a much larger number of customers, you know, online shopping. And again, of course, there was a, a month or two, but it all got pretty hard. But I've been quite impressed with the way that much of the customer facing industry has scrambled and responded to what was very much a, an impending tragedy and turned it into a, a great opportunity. And have you seen um, many changes to operating models or digital programs that have gone in in some of those successful businesses? Well, well, I think, you know, if I use train line as an example, you know, the, the minute that we saw that people weren't going to be traveling in trains, you know, it, it fell off a cliff overnight almost. You have to think, what do we do here, you know, in terms of, you know, still trying to invest, you know, in the app and invest for the future, while also trying to make sure that you, you, you keep going. And so, you know, being a digital business, we, we didn't have, you know, factories and lots of physical assets, you know, more, more, more bits and bytes than, than atoms based, you know, customer service, there's nobody complaining about tickets or wanting, you know, uh, refunds. And so and so that 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 workforce kind of drifted away from us. Uh, the tech teams were kept at the same level and actually they've learned to work remotely very, very well. And, and when I talk to some of our great tech people, they actually quite like the fact that there isn't this constant interruptions and they can actually go on with doing their work. So it's worked for us. I think our biggest challenge was we had lots of great plans, you know, investing in the, the business in Europe where we do quite well. We wanted to accelerate that, to upweight it. And it was just having to balance 
uh, you know, keeping your head above water uh, and not getting too far into debt while having some sort of long-term focus. I think we've gone through it pretty well. I think we've, we've managed that balance very well. Uh, and I think most companies did that. Uh, there was just a lot of prioritization. You know, did you want to get involved in taking government grants? Did you want to get involved in furlough schemes? They all seem like obvious or easy and natural things to do. But actually, the minute you start doing that, you're then impacted in terms of what you can do in terms of paying people and paying dividends and stuff like that. So lots of trade-offs to be made. And, and I think most people have, have now realized that the future of work is probably not going to be everyone in the office Monday to Friday, you know, a rush hour that runs from, you know, 7 o'clock to 9.30 and 4.30 to 6.30. So I think we're going to see the patterns of work changing. And I think that will change how companies go about things. So I think you're seeing you know, development, tech development changing. It's all, you know, it's been moving to a pretty agile format uh, over the past five or six years, and that will continue. And I think those who've been stuck with, you know, the old, you know, mainframe legacy type systems are now going to have to figure out how do we get ourselves into a very different place, which involves, you know, being in the cloud, you know, not having armies of IT staff just doing maintenance stuff instead of new stuff. I think this is all about uh, how, how do you get very good feedback from customers? How do you respond to that? And how do you give them what they want much more quickly? And if you're in the app business, that's just what you do. You know, you're, you're up, you know, you're upgrading uh, or getting the app refreshed, you know, probably three or four times a week. So I think what I've noticed is that pace has actually speeded up over the past year. It hasn't slowed down at all. Do you agree with the adage that all companies have become technology companies? Well, I mean, that, that's right, you know, because just, just being able to talk to people, you needed a certain amount of technology there. You know, and I think those, those who've been caught on, you know, um, you know, old versions of, you know, and I still know people, I don't want them who are in things like Windows 7, etc. You know, once you're caught in that old technology trap, you find it very hard to move the workforce on to, to modern, you know, uh, technology, modern means of communication. So, so, so I, I do think that technology has become even more important to, to even relatively traditional companies. What do you think the key technologies are at the moment in modern businesses? You mentioned cloud, for example, before. I mean, uh, I, I, mean I, I think, you know, look, I, I've, I've been involved in cloud ever since my days in Amazon. You know, cl cloud was a great story. Uh, it, it was almost just a piece of serendipity because if you're in the retail business, uh, you gear up for a massive two weeks around Christmas time. And you have to have, you know, all your staff in, your systems have to be able to cope with demand for those two weeks. You have to have warehouses, you know, ready to handle the inventory for those two weeks. So, so you end up stretching and scaling a business for a two week peak and you're left with that scale for the remaining 50 weeks of the year. And when I was at Amazon, some of the tech teams in Seattle thought, well, actually, we've, we've, we've got all of this capacity coming out of our ears. What can we do with it? And so what we decided to do, what they decided to do is let's see if we can actually sell off a rent out some of these cycles, some of the storage and see if there was a business there. And, and there was a big demand for it. So lots of little developers, lots of bigger developers wanted just to, to store stuff or to write complex programs. Uh, and it really grew like that, almost almost just a skunk works within Amazon. They didn't have any billing system. It was all on credit cards. And then it just grew and grew and grew. And eventually the Amazon business inverted where the cloud became the most valuable part of the business and Amazon's retail business ended up being the cloud's biggest customer. And now you get this amazing anomaly of Amazon's uh, competitors and some of the, the spaces that they're in using the Amazon cloud. So you get Netflix and Amazon Prime, two great competitors, and yet Netflix is happy to run its business in, on, on Amazon's cloud because it's probably the, the cheapest unit cost of computing out there. So I think cloud is very much a, an infrastructure replacement product you know and, and it just means that you, you you buy capacity when you need it and you don't get back to that old amazon model of having to buy capacity for a full year knowing that you weren't going to use most of it for that year so so i think cloud is, is very important obviously I, I i do think that you know mobile and, and what's going on in mobile is absolutely at the front end of your business if you're a customer facing business it's absolutely critical and, and for people who haven't got there yet you might just be too late you know, I, see, I hear lots of people talking about, you know, what they're doing with a website. And, and for many companies today, the website is still almost like an electronic brochure, you know, and, and, and that was that's a kind of 10 year old thinking. I think it's all about it's all about mobile. It's all about how you understand your customer. Uh, and it's through mobile that, that you get to really uh, develop that intimate relationship with the customer. You look at a business like ASOS or Boohoo where they know so much about their customers. They know the customers' dates of birth. They know their age. You know, they, they know their sizes, the color of their hair, 
whether they wear glasses or not, you know, and from that, they can serve up a lot of very um, subtle and relevant recommendations. And, and when, when you have got the challenge of being, say, a, a high street department store, you know very little about your customer. They walk in off the street, if you're lucky, they buy something, they walk out the door and you may never see them again. So I think mobile and that relationship with your customer's mobile allows you to build a, a deep, you know, a permission based uh, relationship with them. In the middle of all of that, I think you've got so so if you think about the cloud as being your back end, you know, where your microservice architecture is for all your apps are, and then the very front end is the mobile where you're talking to customers. In between that, there's a lot of other stuff goes on. And, and that's really where you're into the world of, you know, data, really big data, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning. And, and, and that's really, uh, you're using that. So, you, so your customers are throwing off lots and lots of data. When I think about train line, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of train movements, you know, every hour. And, you know, you're getting data about how busy trains are, you know, where there's capacity, where there's not capacity. And, and you you need to have some way, some algorithm for actually processing that and, and making some sense of it. So again, if I'm catching the, the, especially nowadays, the 728 from walking into London, and it's one of the busiest commuter trains uh, in Britain, I'd like to know in that 12 train, uh, 12 carriage train, where's the spaces? I don't want to stand up beside a whole bunch of people who are breathing all over me. So it will tell me, go to coaches, you know, 11 and 12, and you'll find, you know, Lots of seats. So, so data is out there, data, and it's it's your ability to use data and serve up something of benefit for your customer. That is the key technology to me. So, I think about cloud, I think about uh, data and how you manipulate it, and then I think about the use of mobile and apps to have that that engagement and, and lock in hopefully with your customer. As a board leader, how do you recommend and encourage your senior managers to stay up to date with latest technology trends? Well, I think there's two or three things. You know, I I, I think certainly you've, you've got to eat your own dog food. You know, so so at Trainline, you know, people are using the app all of the time. They're they're picking out you know things that are wrong, or maybe we could do this better. So so I think having your employees engaged in your product, if you can, you know, if you if you're building you know, Rolls Royce aero engines or jumbo jets, you can't really do that. But I think if you're a consumer facing company, I expect the employees to, to know everything about what we're serving up to the customer. So I think, I think that's pretty important. Uh, I encourage, you know, and we do kind of, you know, teach-ins and, you know, an hour at lunch, you know, just in a, in a kind of quick, you know, podcast, webinar, whatever. So, so I think, you know, people, you, you can't afford to, and people don't want to go off on a two or three week course every time something new comes along. So I think you have to serve up in kind of bite-sized modules uh, wh where we're going, you know, wh wh what, what does blockchain mean? You know, is Bitcoin going to be of, of interest to, to our customers in the future? So it's keeping people up to date with trends with enough information for them to have a view on it and have a sensible conversation, not to be a, a professor or an expert. Um, and again, I just encourage people to read, you know, I, I read lots of blogs, I read lots of stuff, and that's how I keep fresh, you know, I, I, I'm a great testament, I think, to the fact that you're, you're never too old to learn, you know, and, and I just love reading about the, the latest cool stuff. And where do you tend to find that new latest cool stuff? Well, as I say, I'm just, just, there's a whole shower of blogs and podcasts that I, I, I listen to, I mean, and even, you know, I still read some of the printed medium, you know, I still read, you know, Daily newspapers mm -hmm. and the Economist and Business Week and Private Eye and stuff like that. But I, I'm I'm quite avaricious. I mean, I, I'd rather read lots of smallish articles than, than immerse myself in a big long deep book. You know, so so to me, reading about current affairs and technology is is a pleasure. It's not a, it's not a kind of burden. Yeah, and also noticing how you're using other apps um, from competitors and, and other industries is always. In interesting Absolutely. as well I mean, isn't it? and you look at you know we've, we've all yeah. gone you know i i've worked i've been a, a member of the government's digital advisory board for a number of years before i, I became the the lead ned at the ministry of defense and i look at what government is doing in general and you look at you know the the nhs you know track and trace art which are you know a pretty bumpy start you know but it actually does provide a, a pretty good purpose today you look at the general nhs app you know and it's got your your, your vaccine status on it it's got a lot of your medical records you know so so even big government is starting to understand that serving your citizens through the mobile you know is a pretty good thing to do and you know we all know that there are probably uh, about eight, mil eight million apps out there today there's about four million in each platform uh, android and ios your average your average teenager or early 20s person will, will have you know less than 30 apps that they really use in that phone so for, for you to land your app on that very prized real estate 
it has to be something that makes their life easier or more pleasurable and and that's the kind of battle so it's easy to get it's easy to create an app but getting people to download it and keep downloading it is the secret of success back to retail for a second what's your vision of the future of the high street you know we're seeing lots of companies closing down on the high street and and especially banks as well what do you think well, I, I you know I, i've always been you know the kind of the the the, the, the dark side for uh, for the tr- traditional retail industry you know and I, I don't think the life is going to get any better you know you look at the number of uh, the, the number of chains and stores that have closed out over the you know the past two or three years you know in the usa jc penny gap you know victoria secrets over here debenhams house of fraser mother you know the, the the list is endless i was reading an article uh in fact this morning uh, in the telegraph of all places about the future of shopping malls in the usa you know and today there's probably 1400 i lived in the usa and the shopping mall was very much a place where families went you know at the weekend you know to eat to look at stuff you know to, to just be together uh, and that's disappearing because of COVID and because people get just so much more used to online shopping. I mean, American retail has lost half a million jobs over the past three or four years. And, and so take Britain as being a smaller version of that. You know, we've certainly lost 100,000. And I think that's going to continue. And it's not that retail is going to completely die, but it has to continue to reinvent itself. I think there are far too many stores out there, you know, and you're caught in this terrible financial trap where you've got all of these stores, you're paying all of these rents, you're paying, you know, business rates, and yet footfall is, is declining. So I don't envy the the financial problems that the traditional retail has got. Much of it is not of their own making. You're, you're, you're caught up with government and taxation and stuff like that. Um, but I think so there are going to be a lot less stores around. You look at the future of the, the high street, the future of a town. You know, I live in a mid-sized town called Camberley. And, and a lot of the, the great chains are just decaying or moving out you know there's very few anchor tenants there now but there are lots of little individual shops you know a lot, a lot of coffee shops you know, a lot of small boutiques uh, a lot of people doing mobile phone services you know or or nail bars or stuff so you know i think water will find its own level but i think if you're a traditional retailer if you're a you know john lewis or somebody with you know a, a number of department stores you see that they are taking very drastic action and that has to be the case i i think if you're in retail today i think you want to almost uh cut deeper than you thought you would have to and, and move even faster because this is not going to get any better. Before the pandemic started, uh, it was hard to get a number on it, but, but, but online retail was probably about 20 to 25% of total retail. I suspect that it's gone up now to, you know, in some cases, in some sectors, north of 50%. Uh, and, and I always thought that 50-50 was a kind of a, a nice, simple balance as to where it would even out. Uh, we may get to 50-50 sooner than I thought because some people will go back to physical shopping now that they're allowed to. But I do think that the, the move to online and the online share of the total retail pie has been increased and exacerbated by the pandemic. And you've heard, you know, uh, the Google head when he announced his results saying it. We've seen, you know, uh, you know, 10 years worth of disruption in the past year. I think that will be the case for many industries and retail is really challenged. And the problems of retail are not about the pandemic. They were there before the pandemic has just accelerated them. I mm. just think there were too many mm. uh, retail leaders who were, I wouldn't call them fat, dumb or happy, but they just didn't, they didn't see what was coming around the corner. You know, they thought that they were smart enough and good enough to weather this online storm. And, you know, I talked to, I used to try, when I was at Amazon, and so I was trying to hire people in from, uh, from some of the traditional retailers because they have got good training and good commercial skills and good trading capability. And when you talk to the online head of some of these big companies, you know, they're like the stepchild, you know, that they're, they're, they're fighting with one arm tied behind their back. They're treated very often in some companies as a, a necessary evil. You know, we have to have this online stuff, but I'd rather just have another three or four stores. And so I think now you get a lot of retailers start to embrace it and really go after it, you know, and some of the big names. I mean, even people at Curry's are kind of finally getting there. But I think it's taking quite a time. It's taken far too long. And I think that... Many of our retailers today still obsess about the wrong things. They want to just talk about like for likes and you know what the numbers were. And you've got to look at your numbers, of course. But some of our big companies used to see that as a kind of great PR thing to talk about. You know what's selling this week. The amount of money that some of them spend on big Christmas adverts, big vanity projects that the customers don't care about. So think about the customer. What Bezos always taught us in Amazon was start with the customer and work backwards. It all begins with the customer.
Well, thanks for leaving it on such a positive <laughs> note there. I was worried we were going to finish on, on doom and gloom, but thanks very much for your time today. Really enjoyed the conversation. For all of you listening, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Make sure that you don't miss the next one by liking and subscribing for free to your podcast platform. If you want to reach out, please contact us at endava.com through the Contact Us button. Until next time. Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Endava. This is Tech Reimagined.